How can we learn from what happened in Cape Town? It was uncertainty that was scary because the idea of taps running dry was very real. Hyper-urbanisation and the complexity of city livings is being tested and challenged in ways we've never seen before. We've really got to question the assumptions of the financial model that informs our, our mm. water. We are in danger of still continuing to apply 19th century thinking and 19th century solutions to a 21st and 22nd century set of challenges. Some people think that resilience is about vulnerability. Some people think it's about bouncing back. The stresses and shocks that relate to the water system could range from drought <coughs> to flooding to malicious damage, to just wear and tear an ageing infrastructure. And what really matters is how this, that system, the whole complexity of that system, uh, performs. In 2015, our average daily consumption was 1,200 million litres per day. By the time we got to there, and we just avoided disaster, we would got it down to just under 500 million litres a day. So that's very nearly 60% shaved off our consumption. And nobody died. Once it was decided that day zero would be the term that we used for the day that the taps are switched off, we started working on how we were going to announce this. It was a term and it was a time where we didn't have to put that much communication effort into it. It was going to capture the imagination, we knew that. I think everybody had the same feeling. I voiced it by saying, you know, if day zero plus 20 were to happen and we all had to stand in line to get water, what you would quickly experience is the world's largest refugee camp. So I think the biggest lesson that I have learned and I think broader Cape Town has learned about uh, the drought is that climate change is here now it's real and it's happening. And the way that we manage our systems and the way that we plan for events like this and, and uh, future events has to be completely different. I think the other thing that we've we really learned um, from the crisis is the importance of collaboration and partnerships. Worldwide, if we're going to try and respond to these short-term crises, then cities need to take confidence and courage in trying to lead and not wait for national governments to try to provide the kind of impetus or the framework or the support structures to enable a, a large city of the size of Cape Town to manage its way through the crisis. If we don't have a way to ensure that the mandates and responsibilities of all three spheres of government are joined together into a coherent decision-making, planning, uh, budgeting system, we are going to continue to get incoherent decisions uh, which will not sustain the water supply in this region. I think that Cape Town's water mix in the future uh, ideally would be a 25% split between surface water, groundwater, reuse and desalination. And water reuse, I would hope, would be common across the city. Information builds trust. And at the moment, I think that the public, most of the people in London, haven't got a clue that uh, it is something that we could be facing. Nobody in London going around their normal business sort of thinks about the fact that we're at any one time we're about two dry winters away from a severe drought. What you've demonstrated to us is that Cape Town took a long hard stare down the barrel of a gun and luckily they avoided what could have been an absolute catastrophe. It's not actually the overall cost, it cost in terms of £330 million pounds a day, it's actually whether you can function as a, as a city, mm. as individuals, mm. whether your business is going to get off the ground and so forth. Um, I, I thought one of the strongest things that came across to me was this sense of um, the building of resilient communities. Uh, because effectively it's not just a, an engineering or technical response, what we saw there really was a truly social technical response. Yeah. I think, and that really sits at the heart of resilience. 
uh, the relationship between uh, water, valuing water, and cost. And I don't think as a society we truly understood the value of water. Uh, I think we only really understand that as, as when it becomes rationed uh, and then when it runs out. I don't think intellectually, technically or psychologically we have yet understood how to manage deep uncertainty. And we're facing deep uncertainty in a way that this kind of society has never had to do before. Mm. And I think what you've done, what we're seeing in other countries is starting to shift, but probably too slow and for some maybe too late. But I think it's an area we need to focus on tremendously. And I do worry at times that we are over planning and underthinking mm. how to manage the future because our plans are predicated on a stable climate. We can no longer yep. take account of that. We've been working um, to develop the city water resilience approach. Around about 80 plus uh, percent of cities were looking at urban water resilience issues. So it's not just Cape Town. Mm. Um, and those resilience issues are not just uh, drought, it's flooding, governance, other issues. So resources like uh, this drought uh, learning initiative uh, will we'll no doubt go global. Um, but I think other cities can learn. So through the city water resilience uh, approach, we've got an ecosystem of uh, eight or so cities now that are looking at different shocks and stresses and they are sharing their learning. And that peer-to-peer -peer learning mm. is, is super powerful. And that's really one of the success stories I think that uh, yeah. we should be celebrating too. At the same time as more resilience, we also want things to be ever more efficient and we cut waste and, 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 and things out of the system. Those two things are fundamentally at conflict. What do the panel think about how we can resolve that conflict? Have you by any chance got an e easier question? <laughs> um, your thoughts? Actually, the just enough, just in time approach that we take for pretty much everything in society is fundamentally, it, well, it lacks resilience. Uh, so we do need to build redundancy in. I don't think that's necessarily at odds with being efficient. To say that the two things are in conflict, I think may give the wrong signal because it's not either or. I think you, yeah. you certainly have a new paradigms of thinking need to come into play. Me. How do we build redundancy, reframe this capacity or maybe kind of breathing space um, yeah. or thinking space mm. into human and intellectual and social systems? I think the word capacity is, is um, a much more positive um, approach to talking about redundancy than the term redundancy, which has loads of negative mm. connotations in every single sense of how we reduce that word. And I think there's something more important. I'm not sure yet we know what good looks like in terms of resilience for water. So building more capacity and storage might be great if you expect the occasional severe drought to get you through one or two years. If you're facing a chronic shift in climate, what does good look like under, under a different future for resilience is still a tough question for us. Because we've lost so many of our high water consumers and the assumptions that our, our financing is based on is that those consumers would cross subsidise the great yeah. number of people you know cannot um, afford to pay for water. Yeah. So I just wanted to see if you had more to say on that aspect. And your, your question is a profound one about um, running a city. How do you run a city now under these kind of conditions? I think the best time to stop is when we've all still got a lot more to say and we really could have kept on talking about that for a really long time. So thanks everybody. Thank you.